We are so excited to have Dr. David Lowe and Kazia Israel here to share some important research tonight. Uh, but before I bring up Dr. Carson to introduce our speakers, um, let me take a couple minutes and share some important upcoming events here with you. The next lecture in this very series will be on April 2nd, uh, featuring none other than Dr. Carson herself and Dr. Zeng, who talk about promoting lifelong brain health. Um, and if you uh, haven't already picked up the flyer, it's outside waiting for you. Please mark it on your calendar. Tomorrow, right here, uh, March 27th, we are continuing our long-standing partnership with our friends at the City of Palm Desert, uh, our public art documentary series uh, featuring the film Barefoot Artist. Uh, this is the third screening um, in this series, a different film each uh, each month. So check that out if you have some time tomorrow. On April 2nd, as I mentioned, we're welcoming uh, Dr. Carson and Dr. Zeng as part of our School of Medicine Bio medical science lecture series on April 4th, uh, still April, uh, as part of our ongoing Wild Coachella lecture series, we're going to be featuring our uh, researchers from the College of Natural and Agricultural Sciences, uh, Danelle Baronia and Melanie Davis, who will talk about the history of fire in the Mojave National Preserve. And on April 11th, uh, as our ongoing collaboration with uh, UCR's Jewish Lecture Series. Uh, we are uh, going to be featuring the Fay Lecture in Jewry and Innovation. Uh, we're going to be welcoming Professor Rami Zwick, who is the Associate Dean for Graduate Programs at UCR's School of Business. So all of this and uh, much, much more at uh, our on our website. Get the information, get our newsletter if you haven't already signed up. I saw a bunch of partners out here. If you're a partner, a UCR Palm Desert Center partner, please raise your hand. Hi, thank you. I see all those smiling faces. Thank you for coming out and supporting us. Thank you for your generosity and your ongoing support. Uh, none of what we do here tonight would be possible without your help, so thank you. All right, without further ado, please allow me to welcome Dr. Carson, who is the Sioux S. Sue Johnson Presidential Endowed Chair in Glial Neuronal Interactions and serves as a professor and chair of the Division of Biomedical Sciences at the University of California, Riverside. She additionally serves as the director of the Center for Glial Interactions and editor-in-chief for the Journal for Neuroinflammation. She has been an active member of both the American International Neuro chemistry societies since graduate school, serving in multiple roles, including president of each society. She received her AB degree from Bryn Mawr College and her PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. Please welcome Dr. Carson. Thank you very much for that very kind introduction. And thank all of you for coming here today. This health and wellness series is a series of three seminars, lectures, interactions with our community here that are featuring the centers from the UCR School of Medicine. This week, we are featuring uh, our center here, which uh, two speakers uh, we're going to be introducing to you, Dr. David Lowe and Kazaya Israel, who are both part of two centers that are really leading a lot of discovery of health and wellness, the good, the bad, and the ugly, of what's going on in our communities here. These are two individuals who are really leading what we hope to be happening more and more in the way research is done nationwide, but very specifically here locally that it's done with our communities, that our communities help us discover what questions should be prioritized, how they should be framed. And so these are two individuals who I'll be telling you a little bit more about, but they're dedicated to taking research to action and working with all of us to figure out how to do that and what actions should be done. Doesn't mean things happen quickly because it takes a while to find out what's going on, what the truth is. And 
seeing all sides of the problem. So that's why I'm very excited about the presentations and the discussions that will happen here today. And so I first start by introducing Dr. David Lowe. He got his MD and PhDs from the University of Pennsylvania. He has served in many roles in a variety of places. He's been the Senior Associate Dean for Research at the University of California School of Medicine for 10 years. He has been a vice president a vice, uh, at a, uh, a biotech uh, company in San Diego. So again, taking research into the real world. He has been a professor at the La Jolla Institute for Immunology and also at the Scripps Research Institute. He is currently the director of BREATHE Center, which is an acronym for Bridging Regional Ecology, Aerosolized Toxins and Health Effects. So that always takes me a while to do. And he is also the director of an NIH-supported Center for Health Disparities Research. He is uh, also, finally, a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Sciences, and he is one of the original recipients, there was like 42 uh, nationwide, of the original Grand Challenges Global Health Awards by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. He's been joined by a really incredible individual, Kazaya Israel. She is a fifth-year graduate student in our PhD program, so she'll be a doctor in not that long, and uh, in the biomedical sciences. She is somebody whose whole approach to everything is action, taking research and doing things with it. She has been a leader in our graduate program, serving as the president of the Graduate Students Association. She's been part of the leadership in these things in times of real change, how academia itself is changing, and sort of being that bridge, that conduit, helping two sides talk to each other. And this is exactly who we want in research. And as she goes forward, she's dedicated to going not just into academia, she actually is looking to go into either industry, biotechnology, because she's again wants to be taking how we've learned and putting it into action. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome, I think Dr. David Lowe will be speaking first, so I'd like to welcome him so that he can start his presentation, um, which will be Asthma in the Salton Sea, Community Studies on the Disparate Effects of Environmental Exposures and Health Impacts. Okay, thanks. Um, you, you can hang up here too. So we'll try to do a smooth transition between our different parts here, so... Okay. Let's see here. Um, all right. So we're going to tell you three related stories. Um, first, we're going to talk about how this entire project really came from the community, that we began it. We've learned so much from talking to families. Um, especially in Eastern Coachella Valley, and they really shaped the project. Um, next, we're going to talk about how we got this project started, again, with the guidance of the community, um, and Kazai is going to talk about um, some of the aspects of how we actually did the research, how we made the discoveries we made, and then I'm going to close with connecting a lot of the dots to try to make sense for what for what we've learned and how it matters to anybody who lives in this region. So I start off here, this is really a cast of thousands, um, both from the Breeze Center and the Center for Health Disparities Research. A lot of it, as I said, was important because of the community engagement, uh, promotoras, uh, families that we met with way back um, years ago, as well uh, as research support from a variety of sources, not only the NIH, but also CARB, as well as um, the local uh, congressional earmark, and also now from the Bureau of Reclamation. So a lot of these things where um, they, the stakeholders have really contributed to um, doing the work that we're doing. So briefly, the take-home message is that we know any of you, all of you must know that in this area, uh, living near the Salton Sea, that there are very, there's a very high incidence of asthma in the community, especially uh, most alarmingly among the children. And the 
question is whether or not that's due to something particular to the Salton Sea. And the families tell us that it's really pointing to the Salton Sea. Where, and so our mission has been to try to understand that connection between the Salton Sea and the health effects that we're seeing. Um, there are other things that families told us about, other immunologic symptoms, and we'll get into that a little bit later. So the studies we did was to try to understand what is the connection between salt and sea and the clinical symptoms we are seeing and some of you may also be seeing in this region. And the um, the results we've seen so far that Kazai is going to tell you is that it looks like a major component is a bacterial toxin produced in the sea that makes its way onto the playa into the dust and people are breathing it chronically. And we have been doing, uh, we did a, a, with the HARC um, group over here in, in this area, we've been working with for many years, we did an epidemiology study and showed that there are interesting correlations between the symptoms and the incidence of these symptoms and the toxins that we've been studying. So that's a very um, interesting, albeit potentially alarming, um, correlation. And that this leads to supporting a uh, hypothesis that these bacteria are producing this toxin. And depending on where you live, you're exposed to different levels of it that may account for the symptoms that people are seeing. Okay, so how did we get involved? As I said, the first part of this is really going to be about how important it was having these conversations with the community. Um, I'm an immunologist by training, and the basic you know, clinical sort of approach is that a kid comes in wheezing, they say they have asthma, you just hand them an inhaler and tell them to go away. And the assumption for most parts of the country and most kids that 90% of those are just kids with allergies, they come in, they're allergic, you know, somebody was mowing the lawn or something like that. And so off too often the assumption is that it's allergic disease. And the families are not immunologists, they're not clinicians, and so they're just saying, well, but whatever it is, something at the Salton Sea is responsible. And people who live in the area day after day, they experience their experience in their lives tells us much more than anything we could do by just waltzing in and starting to take samples. And so this is something we really had to take seriously. And so we wanted to understand why they were all telling me it's the Salton Sea. It's doing, it's responsible in some way. So now our responsibility was to try to do the research to try and dissect out how that might actually be um, so. So as I said, we started with discussions with the families, had community advisory board, uh, discussing with promotoras and so on. And we did some various collaborations with a number of organizations, Alianza, Coachella Valley was one of them, HARC is another, um, and so on. And so we've also not just tried to learn from the families and the community organizations, but also to have a two-way um, communication. So what I'm going to show you in the next few slides is showing the ways in which we are responsible for informing communities, and partly why we're giving this presentation here too, is what are we doing and what are we learning? And so we can then get more feedback from you. What are we missing? What are we trying to uh, look for that you can help us uh, discover even deeper um, questions to, to study? Now, part of this, of course, was... In the middle of all of this work, we had a minor pandemic. And so that certainly had some impact on the kind of research we were able to do. But we still managed to do a number of things. So, for example, California Air Resources Board is beginning to come. They mainly focus on things like vehicle emissions. But they began to come around to the idea that air quality in places like um, the Salton Sea region had important um focus areas for them because the air quality was going to ha was clearly having health impacts. So they helped sponsor um, a series of community forum events that we did in, in the region where we brought together researchers, community organizations, legislation, uh, legislators, and, you know, all the various kinds of organizations and, and um, representatives from the region and communicated with families and communities in these sessions. They are actually, it's presented online, so all of these are taped, videos in English and Spanish, so you can look at these. 
as well. And so again, you can learn what people have been doing, what we know so far. Um, and so that's an example of the kind of communication we're doing. And you can see there's a broad um, participation with the uh, indigenous Native American tribes, um, with organizations, universities, um, legislative um, offices, uh, other kind of community organizations as well. Another thing that we were doing, and if you noticed out in the tables there, we have comic books um, that are both in English and Spanish trying to explain what we know so far about what's going on at the Salton Sea. And so we had some very talented artists work on these comics, and you, uh, you know, I encourage you to um, take them uh, when, when um, you're on your way out there to try to communicate. Now, these were not aimed just at like little kids. These are aimed at families. So the illustrations, the information we're trying to convey is really um, not highly technical, but trying to convey what we understand about pulmonary disease, asthma, as well as what are the contributions of dust at the Salton Sea, what's going on there that may be important. Another thing, we just launched this today, is a website called the Salton Sea Forum, which has a series of two-page summaries. The first set are in English, but we'll be translating them into Spanish as well, on various topics like the ecosystem, what's in the dust, um, as well as basic information on what is asthma, what is inflammation, things like that. So I encourage you to look at the website and, and um, download some of those uh, two-page um, layman level kind of uh, reports to, to get information. And we will be posting um, a place where you can give us feedback on what other topics you want us to cover on that website. Okay, now um, this is, now. so having done that, now we're getting, the question is that the, the community told us we had this really important issue to address. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about how we got there, and then Kazai is going to uh, e explain um, how, how we got there. As I said, the families were telling us that the Salton Sea was responsible for all these kinds of immunologic-related symptoms that the kids are experiencing. And so the ones we focused on for the following studies were asthma, of course, but also things like nosebleed and skin rash. Because a lot of times you might assume that these are related, so we wanted to know, were these all due to exposure to whatever's happening at the Salton Sea, and what are the kinds of things that might be responsible? And from a medical translational point of view, we understand, we want to understand how in the world is it doing those things um, to people. So we started with the dust, and with Emma Aronson's group um, at UC Riverside, I don't know if you noticed that outside this building there are a series of 10-foot tall poles and some of them have bunt pans, and they have sterilized marbles in them. That's how we collect our dust. And the poles are all over the Salton Sea region, and the dust flows over those marbles and falls in between to the bottom of those bunt pans, and that's how we gather our dust. And they'll sit out there from like two to six months, and because we can gather them from all over the region, and Kazai is going to show you what kind of results we get from that sort of thing. And I th is this, is it your turn now? One more, okay. Okay, so um, if you're not already familiar with this map, you can see that just in, the, in recent years, how much Salton Sea has retreated and how much playa has been exposed. Those are a major source of dust emissions, and that will turn out to be really important in what we're going to talk about later. So this map is just basically to show you that, you know, when you look at Google Earth, you will see how much, especially at the northern and southern ends of the Salton Sea, how much the retreat of the lake has been exposing that playa. And, and we think that's really um, relevant to... Okay. Kazaya? All right. Well, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a scientific journey just to explain some of our research and also finally provide you guys with some answers. So first, starting with what is asthma? Asthma itself is a very complex disease, which is mainly characterized by the inflammation within the lung, as well as airway constriction. And ultimately, asthma is typically clinically diagnosed via the assessment for a variety of different symptoms, most of those being listed here, such as chest tightness and pain, coughing, wheezing, narrowing of your airways, as well as excessive mucus production in the respiratory tract. 
So you may be asking, what is this word inflammation that you guys keep throwing around? Well, inflammation itself is actually our body's defense against any invading foreign material. And it's a very complex process, but it can be summarized in a variety of few steps, which begin with our body's recognition that we are in danger, the recruitment of these inflammatory cells to then help fight off infection, the production of inflammatory molecules to help these cells to fight off this infection, and ultimately the clearance of these invading microbes. So as I briefly described, inflammation is a very complex process, but ultimately there are two arms that exist. You have innate immunity, which is your body's initial response to any foreign material invading your body, which is more of a general immune response. However, after a certain a few days of inflammation, you'll have your adaptive immunity kick in, which is where your body has now recognized this foreign material and is able to produce these things called antibodies to directly target whatever pathogen is invading your body. So asthma itself is very, very complex, and it also has a few different subtypes. The main subtypes that we'll like to stress here are allergic inflammation, which is categorized by the recruitment of these cells known as eosinophils into the airways. The next subtype is non-allergic inflammation, which is characterized by the recruitment of these neutrophils. So there are a variety of differences between these two forms of the disease. However, the two main points that we like to drive home here is that allergic inflammation is actually the most common form of asthma, as Dr. Lowe had previously mentioned. And there are a variety of different treatment options that are available for this form of the, the disease. So people who typically suffer from allergic asthma typically have a very well-managed disease. When as compared to non-allergic inflammation, this is a less common form, however, a more severe form of that illness. And there also exists no real effective treatment options for this type of asthma, which is why this is very stark and interesting. So our lab was tasked with figuring out just how the sawn seed dust is related to asthma. So in order to do this, we teamed up with a group of engineers at UCR in order to create these environmental exposure chambers. And these chamber systems are very important as they allow us to mimic real world exposure. So we expose mice in these chambers to a variety of different aerosols, and then we test for toxicity as well as inflammatory effects within the lung. So using this system, we were able to expose our animals to allergens in order to create a clinically relevant allergic asthmatic model to address this question of if the salt and sea dust induces allergic asthma or is this some sort of other disease that we're seeing within the region. So to do this, we teamed up with another lab at UCR in order to create these Passive dust collectors, which are essentially bunt pans, as Dr. Lowe described, on top of 10 feet tall poles situated at a variety of sites around the Salton Sea. So using this dust, we're able to expose our animals in our environmental exposure chamber, in which we expose them to dust collected from the region for a variety of different time periods, from 48 hours up until seven days. And what we do is we wash the airways of these animals, as well as collect the lung in order to identify different cells that are recruited. So we take these cells and we use this huge fancy instrument here that will remain nameless, and we are able to differentiate whether we have recruitment of those eosinophils, which are representative of allergic asthma, which we initially expected to see within the region, or if we have recruitment of neutrophils in this model, which are representative of non-allergic asthma. So ultimately, with this experimental process, we're able to characterize the type of inflammation that we're seeing in this mouse model and answer that question of what is going on when, these, when people are exposed to salt and seed dust. So as briefly mentioned, when we initially began testing the dust and exposure to that of the salt and sea, we had no idea what inflammatory response we were going to see. So in order to categorize this, we were able to expose animals to frequent environmental contaminants in order to generate inflammatory profiles that we can then reference back to from the salt and sea exposed animals. So in doing this, we expose animals to Alternaria alternata, which is a common household fungus known to lead to allergic asthma. And on the other hand, we expose mice to LPS, which is a bacterial component, and this allowed us to create a model of non-allergic asthma. So this was so that we can then backtrack from animals that were exposed to salt and sea dust and see if they were experiencing symptoms that were related to, or an inflammatory profile that was related to allergic asthma versus that of non-allergic asthma. So just to help us further characterize the disease in the region. 
So I'd like to come back to this slide just to emphasize those subtypes of asthma that are prevalent. So we have allergic asthma, which is again categorized by the infiltration of these eosinophils, while non-allergic asthma, that more severe form of the disease, is characterized by the recruitment of these cells known as neutrophils. One point that I like to drive home is that most asthma is allergic. However, once we were doing mouse exposures to the salt and sea dust, we did not see evidence for allergic disease. In fact, what we saw is that when we exposed animals to salt and sea dust for 48 hours, we actually saw recruitment of these cells or neutrophils. We saw significant recruitment into the airways and which was interesting in that it actually directly mimicked that of exposure to LPS, that bacterial endotoxin that we briefly mentioned. So ultimately what this data showed was that exposure to the dust mimics exposure to bacterial endotoxin or LPS with the significant recruitment of these neutrophilic cells representing non-allergic inflammation. So LPS itself is short for lipopolysaccharide. This is a component of certain types of bacterial cell walls. And what I like to really point out here is that LPS itself is not toxic. It's honestly our body's response to this, um, to LPS that actually leads to the downstream inflammation and therefore the associated damage. So with our salt and sea exposures looking as if the, well, mimicking the response to LPS, we hypothesized that perhaps LPS is in the dust and what's driving the pulmonary inflammation within the region. So to test this question, we took wild-type animals, which possess the receptor for LPS, also known as TLR4. We exposed them to the dust for 48 hours, and then we studied the inflammatory cell recruitment, in which we saw significant recruitment of these neutrophilic cells, which was not shocking, as that's what we had seen previously when we exposed the animals to dust collected from a variety of reason, um, regions around the salt and sea. However, when we knock out this receptor to LPS, so in this animal model, the cells of this mouse are not able to recognize LPS and therefore not able to generate a downstream inflammatory response if LPS is that driving factor. And that is in fact exactly what we saw. We saw that when we knocked out the receptor for LPS, there was no recruitment of any of these cell types in this model, kind of further supporting our hypothesis that LPS may be this driving factor within the dust. So the only logical progression of this project was then to measure, well, is LPS even found in the dust samples that we've collected? So we began to measure the levels of LPS concentration in those samples. And what we really wanted to see here was if the concentration of the toxin actually related to asthma incidents that we see within the region. So when we begin to measure the concentration of LPS in the dust, we found a very striking pattern in which it seemed to be steadily increasing from the north to southern end of the sea. So ultimately, we place Riverside here very approximately. This is just for reference. But what we notice here is that you almost see a 200-fold increase in LPS concentration when looking at the Riverside region when compared to the southern region of the sea. And that is also backed by these bar graphs here, which show pulmonary inflammation. And what this is showing is the recruitment of those neutrophils into the airway. When animals were exposed to dust collected from the northern region of the sea, you'll see that there is no cellular recruitment in our exposed animals when compared to our control animals. However, when looking in the southern region of the sea, looking at sites such as Worcester or our agricultural site, you see that when animals were exposed to the dust from this region, they had an extreme reaction and there is significant neutrophil recruitment. And this is interesting because this infl inflammatory profile that we see in our mice almost directly overlaps with the increasing concentrations of LPS found in the dust. And I like to remind you that LPS is an environmental contaminant, so we do not expect to find it in the samples, and let alone not at these alarmingly high rates. So with this data, we decide to then do some epidemiological studies, which Dr. Lowell get into, to see if the toxin levels were matching that of the asthma incidents within the region. Thanks. So as I said, we had done this um, epidemiology study with um, our collaborators at HARC, and so we did a survey of a variety of clinical symptoms relating to things like asthma, 
diagnosis, asthma symptoms, as well as skin rash, nosebleeds, things like that, or that the families had drawn our attention to. And this map here shows, um, again, the brown shows you how much of exposed playa there is, but also the green dots shows you where all of the respondents live. So it gives us a geospatial set of coordinates to be able to compare where the symptoms are versus ed, as compared to where they actually live. And so this turned out to be an incredibly uh, important, useful set of data to correlate because when we started looking at the percentage of families reporting that they have asthma in their family, it's already alarmingly high even in eastern Coachella Valley, so it's already 10, 13 to 19 percent in terms of symptoms. But when you go further south into Imperial Valley, the percentage of families reporting asthma in their family approaches 40 percent. Think of that. That means that you have basically half of the families have asthma in their, in their household. And that correlates with what Kazaya was saying, that the highest levels of endotoxin, the LPS, that we're seeing are also in that same region. And so there is that concern that that correlation may be pointing us directly to the toxin that's in the dust that's directly um, contributing to the clinical symptoms that we're seeing. Um, so if we, we're now in the process of working with um, statisticians to overlay all of these layers of data and try to actually develop a little bit more precise predictability on saying if you live here, you're likely to be exposed to this level of toxin and your chances of your family having asthma in it would be a, a, a useful number. So the predictability is going to matter for a lot of reasons, whether it's for policy, whether it's for whether you want to live there or not. Um, those, those kinds of, um, that kind of information can be quite useful. And if you weren't already aware of the serious medical and economic impact of this, now we're going to be able to assign more precise numbers on what that actually, that impact may be. So um, as, as researchers, we want to try to understand why those relationships exist. And so among the things that you probably could tell is that the huge amount of agriculture activity at the southern end includes not just the irrigation from the Colorado River as well, but also things about cons people have concerns about, say, pesticides and so on. But a major factor, of course, is the fertilizer that goes into the agriculture activity. And all of that runs off and goes neatly into the southern end of the Salton Sea. So our thinking is that what's happening is that this is a nutrient burden and it drives the growth of bacteria and algae in the water there because it's sunlight. You know, For the same reason the growing season is year round, the bacteria living in the Salton Sea benefit as well. You got fertilizer, you got warmth, you got water all those lovely things. And so the other additional factor is that the Salton Sea is nearly twice as salty as the Pacific Ocean. So most bacteria don't live under those conditions. And from our collaborating uh, microbiologists, we've learned that bacteria have to be able to survive at high salt conditions by reinforcing their cell walls. Well, the main component of those cell walls is LPS. So just by having to tolerate the high salt conditions, they produce more of the same toxin that we're seeing that produces the inflammatory response. And we think that's what's happening is that at that place where the bacteria are growing and, di and dying and releasing their components, that is what's being brought up onto the ply and into the dust, and then people are breathing it night and day. Um, so, this geographic correlation data is actually useful for other reasons. So, for example, we, you know, we could say, oh, well, everything is worse in the South. I mean, um, that is actually not so clear cut because if we look at things like skin rash, it turns out that it doesn't match the pattern in terms of the geography as asthma. In fact, the hot spots for skin rash appear to be in places like Salton City and North Shore, whereas Imperial County is relatively unscathed. 
it turns out that if you look at things like groundwater contamination with arsenic, you see in the bottom right, it almost matches right on top of the incidence of skin rash. So it's a good control for the asthma data, but it suggests we have other ways to use the data to identify other clinical symptoms. In this case, the suspicion is that the high incidence of skin rash may be related to groundwater contamination with arsenic. So don't shower with uh, well water if you live there. Okay. So these are the kinds of things where the kind of analysis we're doing is able to tell us inf useful things. And it's again, this was because the families were telling us, how do you explain these symptoms? And now we're beginning to find the tools to help us do that. So um, I'm going to conclude, basically, we are, you, you're um, seeing where we are in the midst of a lot of analysis. We have a lot more assays to do, a lot more data collection, and so on. So there's still plenty of, plenty of work to do. And we still need to understand more about the clinical symptoms. That's because I talked about, you know, like clinical symptoms, laboratory data. We want to do actual clinical studies to find out, do the markers and symptoms that the kids are experiencing help us understand better how the aerosol toxins are actually causing their disease and maybe even lead us to some ways to actually potentially treat those those disease because asthma is a chronic disease there's no cure Me medically it's mainly just managed so that you don't lose lung capacity prematurely and so if we find ways to address the inflammation and so on we can at least hope to try and save lung capacity before these kids get too old and honestly that same goes for adults you don't want to lose lung capacity prematurely either so we have, as I said, we have lots of work to do. We have lots of understanding to say how does the air actually lead to the clinical symptoms? How, what are the mechanisms that could affect your, your lung health and so on? So um, I'm going to end here. And I want to thank you for your attention. Uh, again, here we are just launched that website today, but it will grow. We will have much more uh, reports for you to read. And please send us feedback on what kinds of reports you want to learn about. And so we have at the university and our colleagues around the region, we have so much expertise that can help us provide information back to you in terms of the kinds of information you want to know. So. Um, thank you. So at this time, we ask you to sit over there, and we'll have a Q&A session. And uh, we have somebody right off the bat before they've even sat down. Awesome. And so can you... He's going to bring a microphone, so just... In your model, uh, is the, the pattern of prevailing winds a factor in where it's being blown to more than others? Well, we actually happen to have an expert on that in the room. Where did Will Porter go? He's in the back there. So he's been studying transport. So like, where did the stuff come from that you're breathing? Now, honestly, because our dust collectors really are sampling what actually gets delivered rather than where it came from. So yes, that's an important thing, and I don't. I'm, Will has a lot more detailed information, but the general thing is that there's seasonal differences in the wind. You know, whether it's coming from north to south and west to east, and I, I don't know. Maybe Dr. Porter, could you just give a quick answer? Sure. I, absolutely. The prevailing wind direction is very important as far as the chronic exposure that Dr. Lowe was talking about. I will note that, of course, as many experience here, the wind patterns can shift dramatically from season to season and even day to day, uh, even, even over the course of one day as winds go upslope or downslope. But in terms of the dominant wind directions, I, I do think that that pattern we're seeing up there, uh, especially with respect to the, the Imperial Valley incidence of asthma, uh, could very well be connected to that dominant wind pattern. Things like dust events with admissions to hospitals or um, things like that. So. So we have several hands coming up. We'll try to get to you. I see there's one there, one there, then there's one in this, this first quadrant. So we'll, 
We'll slowly get through everybody. So let's go up there first. Hi, so this is directly related to the previous question. Have you studied the impact of the October 2022 haboob, which actually led to the, um, sorry, the death of my dog, unfortunately, in just a few days. So I'm really, it's, it impacted our lives pretty um, sadly. But I would think that especially with that huge event where so much dust came in directly from the south of the valley and came across this entire valley might might lead to so, some interesting data. So I, I mean, so... Again, Will is the expert. We are focusing on chronic exposures. So individual dust events may have an acute effect, like whether you're going to show up in the emergency room. But if you live in the val in the area, you're going to be breathing this stuff day after day after day. But yeah, the the haboobs, the the various dust events. I, I don't know, Will, you want to comment? Yeah, I'm very sorry to hear about your dog. By the way, that's that's very tragic. Um, and I'll I'll note that that particular haboob, um, we have a, a particulate matter sensor on the roof of this very building here at UCR Palm Desert, and the EPA standard for PM10, which is that coarse particulate matter, is 150 micrograms per cubic meter. We measured 14,000 at one point when the, that first wave, and when you see the pictures, you, you believe that very clearly, that it was that dusty. Um, and it's one example, I think, again, is where we have that east to west drive where we have these dust events that can affect people up and down the valley, uh, especially for those acute exposures, um, which can also, we believe, uh, be potentially important. So I want to make sure that it's, we're clear that the there is the particulate matter concentration, but also what actually is in the dust. So proximity to the Salton Sea may be related to what's actually drawn up from the water into the dust. And even then, even if it's only a small percentage of the total dust that you're breathing, it's a, it's a lot of different factors you're trying to take into consideration. So in acute, so medically, you have irritant receptors in your lung. So if you, if somebody blows smoke at you, um, it can trigger an asthmatic attack as well, even if it doesn't contain the LPS that, that we've been studying. So there are a lot of different things that can lead to symptoms and things like emergency room or even status asthmaticus, which is, you know, potentially fatal. That's a good... I was wondering, could the bacteria that's emanating from the lake drift down into the Imperial Valley and become integrated into the food that's being grown there and then shipped out to the rest of the nation? That is, that is, that, um, we have not studied that question. Um, that, I mean, you know, wash your salad. <laughs> I think well, it's in the back. Is, no, so this is an important it. question because when, when in agriculture, like in, you know, the Central Valley and so on, people are concerned about various, um, toxins coming from like if you, if you're growing cabbage near a hog farm, right? You know, it's not a good thing, right? Because certain strains of E. coli that could be lethal could get in there. So people are trying to monitor some of those things. The question is whether or not, as you're asking, the bacteria that we're studying in the Salton Sea that are salt tolerant, are those even on the list of things to monitor? That I don't know, but I suspect that's not. I think there's one up there. They had the microphone up there. Thank you. Um, I just wondered two questions. I, I understand that you're studying mostly the children. Um, I just started having asthma at this age only within the last year. And none of the medications my provider has given me has worked. And so I'm considering that this might be an issue for me. My question to you is, is do you suspect, and you may not be able to answer this, if I were to leave the valley that I would get better? Well, well there's an experiment you can do. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I'm just concerned because if it's endotoxins, you know, yeah. and if, if none of the meds are working... You well, know, how well, fatal is this going to be to these poor children, let alone me? You know? there, there are two reasons for the focus on children. One is that it's a bad time to start a lifelong chronic disease, right? Um, often, you know, we were trained that, you know, children outgrow, uh, often they will outgrow asthma. But in fact, that they don't outgrow the disease. Their airways get bigger, and so they are less symptomatic. 
Now, if you're getting symptoms as an adult, I, I would, you know, that's something to be concerned about. But again, um, an individual, I don't know your, you know, lab tests or, you know, fun lung function and things like that. But yeah, you can, you can do your own experiment, you know, and, you know, spend a week at the beach and see how that goes. Um, because it's, it's chronic, we're talking about chronic exposures, not a single dust event. So uh, I, I don't know. I mean, it, I'm not going to send you a bill if you get better, but <laughs> <laughs> you can, okay, you can learn from yourself. I may have un misunderstood, but did I understand you to say that you turn off the LPS receptors in rats? And if it's that easy, isn't it a, an easy treatment that it you should try? Not at all an easy process. These are mice that are bred from a company that we then buy from them. So this takes years and years of actual integration in order to get rid of this receptor. So we just got the back end, the good part, the animals that already had the receptor knocked out, and then we just put them in the chamber and expose them to the dust. Um, this is almost to the point of the last question. It seemed to me that when you mentioned that asthma cannot be cured, it, it can only be treated. Um, if this is the asthma that's not an allergy, but is a product of the dust, then if you take that person out of the dusty area, wouldn't it be likely that they w could be cured? Or does it damage the, the lungs? We hope to find out. I, I don't have an, a, a quick, easy answer. Those are the kinds of things we would like to find out. Because, well, well actually, because I has been doing these studies, um, in patients with allergic disease, it's not reversible because the tissue, the inflammation and so on causes fibrosis and that's not reversible. So the question she's, I should let her answer the question. We're trying to find out is whether this is reversible. Yeah. Well, we don't necessarily have that answer just yet, but ultimately that's exactly what we're trying to see. So we're exposing animals to the dust and to the endotoxin, allowing them to rest and see if there's any recovery period there. And I can say that in the data, we are seeing some sort of slight recovery, which could make a little sense as you're already saying with this endotoxin, with removal from breathing that endotoxin, you may have some sort of repair there. The uh, inflows to the Salton Sea are continuing to decline and I guess are threatened to decline even further uh, if the Bureau of Reclamation divvies up the uh, diversions uh, of the Colorado River in a different way. Have you any intention of studying whether increasing um, volumes of playa, as to say as the sea recedes you'll have more playa, do you have any intention of studying whether the increasing playa will either increase the incidence of asthma in the region or the intensity of asthma in the region? That is such a tricky question. I mean, um, over thousands of years, there would be overflow from the Colorado and no irrigation canal. So then the basin would fill up and then if in a year or two it would dry up completely and we didn't have reports of the Native American tribes having asthma. So they didn't have time to develop this kind of unusual ecosystem. So we are in a peculiar place because we don't know what any particular change will do to that ecosystem because it already is unusual. So my question is, does LPS degrade, and is there anything conceivably that one could do to the playa dust to accelerate that degradation? Do you want to answer that? Okay. Under normal conditions, regular bacterial endotoxin does deteriorate. And so we were a little surprised to see such high levels. And our hypothesis is that because they had to tolerate such high salt conditions, they've had, we know that bacteria have enzymes to modify the LPS. 
to make it more resistant to the high salt. So the question is that modification, making it also more resilient in the environment so it's not degrading the way we would expect. But then the question is, yes, I mean, it's not like we can just pull out an enzyme spray and, and degrade it. But I mean, that that's the kind of questions uh, we can begin to look at. Thank you. Uh, question as it relates to the uh, cases of respiratory problems in the East Valley, specifically Imperial and the East Coachella Valley. Um, what would you say percentage wise um, are the cases of respiratory problems down there versus anywhere else in the state of California? Well, um, if you look at the state public health data, the highest incidence of hospital admissions for asthma is Mono County. But guess what? There's a lake there called Mono Lake, and it's a saline lake, terminal lake. So um, I was intrigued by that. Um, so um, again, tons more epidemiology, a lot more detailed work we need to find out about these communities as well as other places. Um, I'm going to go to a meeting in Salt Lake City where they're having concerns about agriculture runoff and increasing asthma levels there too. So um, we may be seeing around the world uh, this pattern emerging. I'd like to just briefly add on that for reference. The percentage of asthma incidents in California is about 11% as compared to that 40% that we saw in the asthma incidents within the Northern Imperial Valley. So if that helps to put some numbers to it. In the back. Hi, um, there's plans to start mining lithium on the Salton Sea. If they start doing that, is that gonna stir up the um, nasty little, dust that's going to contribute to increased asthma? And if so, are there plans to hold the company accountable for um, any disease that comes out of that? Well, my quick answer is that it's unrelated, but Mike McKibben is sitting here who is the actual expert. Do you want to say anything? Over here, uh, maybe if we get a microphone to him, he can answer this. Dr. McKibben? So the type of lithium uh, extraction they're doing is not mining. They're not going to be digging huge areas of ground up and disturbing that. They're actually using the existing wells that are already pumping brine out of the ground to extract the lithium from, so they will have a negligible effect on the dust. In fact, the companies have talked about planting various types of organisms to try and suppress any dust stir up that might occur. Uh, targeted antibiotics, is that a feasible approach versus a broad spectrum antibiotic? If you want to die from an antibiotic resistant bug, <laughs> I mean, we know that's a problem. I mean, cattle, cattle, I mean, livestock are just, and chickens and so on. You know, I, I would, I would preferentially not go there, I buy, try to buy chicken that is not fed with antibiotics, same with beef. So I'm be worried of the unanticipated consequences of doing large scale treatment on that, on that type of. We have microphones going to two different people in this corner and this corner, and then we're at the top of the hour. I know that at will get these two questions and then maybe thank them and anybody who wants to stay and continue talking, we can stay for a bit, but allow the, the group to be free. So we'll start up here on the right. Is it safe to assume that your um, eosinophils, the elevations are in the blood work? Yeah, yes, I mean, that, that's one of the first places you'd look. It's also in the lung tissue where it's causing all that damage. Okay. But yes, it's in the bloodstream. So that's a common thing when you do a regular CBC. So you're what, looking at what the is the level? I mean, when, that would cause concern with the two? Well, well, that's going to vary from one individual to the next. I mean, normally in an individual, it's only like, you know, one to two percent. I mean, they're not t entirely absent. They're still there. 
Um, and depending on how severe your allergy or uh, acute exposure and things like that, it can shoot up a lot. But that individual number could just be a moment in time. So it's hard to say that this number equals that. And there are other things that cause the eosinophils, like, say, parasite infections. So there are other, I mean, the eosinophils do good things when they're there for the right reason. Okay, so this might be a controversial topic, but as someone who doesn't necessarily approve of animal testing, I get this is all for human health, but is there any other way of testing that doesn't put the lives of animals in danger? And if not, do you at least help them not suffer for the rest of their lives after they're tested on? Well, this is an important issue in biomedical research in general. Um, in order to be allowed to do mouse work, we have to ensure that they are healthy when we start the studies. We are have to make sure that they are well anesthetized, for example, if we do any kind of procedure on them, um, that sort of thing. We also have to ensure that we use as few as possible. All right, so we want to make sure that we design the experiments very carefully with a lot of thought and a lot of organization and the best equipment we can, so we use a minimum number of animals possible. Now, the concern may be is that if you use too few, do you have enough information to really make a solid conclusion? And that's the battle we always have to address. But the other point I'd make is that we're looking at how inflammatory cells go from your bloodstream into the lung tissue and cause the damage and the symptoms of, uh, of asthma and things like that. Unfortunately, there are no cell culture or computer models that can replicate that phenomena. And we're looking at consequences of that inflammatory response on the health of, of people as well. And so um, while it would be great to learn from what we've done so far and say, well, now how do we use that to design a simpler model to test? So now the kinds of questions we're asking is like, can we do field testing for endotoxin without having to use animals, for example? That's the direction we want to go. So I think that's a great place uh, to end. We've had really great questions about what's going on. We had contributions from experts in the audience, and we had really important topics, ethics, and everything brought up and your health concerns. I really thank you for your time and attention, and let's thank our speakers.